is more inspiring and a better alternative than Kim Beasley was. If that proves to be the case longer term, then the Coalition has a real fight on its hands. But two words will provide comfort in their darkest hour. Two words, economic security. Rarely, if ever, a government thrown out when the economy is strong. A fascinating year lies ahead. Coming up this morning on Insiders, the panel, Paul Kelly, and our program guest, Labor's Deputy Leader, Julia Gillard. But first, the news headlines, and it's good morning, Nicole Chettle. Thanks, Barry. Good morning. An extensive air and sea search has resumed for the missing Australian kayaker, Andrew McCauley. Mr McCauley set out from Tasmania last month in a bid to become the first solo kayaker to cross the Tasman. Rescue services last night retrieved his upturned kayak in rough seas off New Zealand's South Island. There's been no sign of Mr McCauley. He was expected to arrive in Milford Sound today. The Prime Minister has pledged to boost aged care funding by $1.5 billion. In a bid to woo older voters, John Howard's plan includes cash to offset aged care centre fee rises and more money for people who choose to stay in their own homes. And the US Democrat Barack Obama has officially declared himself a candidate for president, promising to lead a new generation as the nation's first black president. The first term senator pledged to fundamentally change American politics and to build a more hopeful country. Mr Obama wants US combat troops out of Iraq by March next year. And Barry, I'll be back with more news at 11 o'clock. Nicole, thank you. Well, coming up, Paul Kelly in the panel. But now to our program guest. And this morning, it's Labor's new Deputy Leader and Shadow Minister for Workplace Relations, Julia Gillard, who joins me now from Canberra. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Barry. Let's be clear on work choices. If elected, you'll throw out the legislation, the whole lot, and start again. Yes, we'll repeal the so-called Work Choices Act and we will have a whole new act, an act of industrial relations laws that restore the balance in this country. I think the sense in the Australian community is the pendu pendulum has gone too far, that we've lost balance in our workplaces, that there's now too little rights for employees and too much latitude for employers, and we want to put the pendulum back in the middle. Will there be any place at all for AWAs, Australian Workplace Agreements? No, we will be abolishing Australian Workplace Agreements. But what happens to the one million people who now are signed up on AWAs? What happens to the status of those agreements? Well, we've already said, Barry, that we will have sensible transitional arrangements for those workers who want their AWA to last for the life of the agreement, it can. For those workers who want to move to other industrial instruments, they can do that. But of course, when we're talking about Australian workplace agreements, we've got to remember that a lot of workers are experiencing these agreements as cutbacks in their pay and conditions. We know from the scanty figures the government's given us that more than 60% of workers lost penalty rates, more than 50% lost shift work loadings, more than 40% lost public holidays, 100% lost something. And it's no surprise that that means for casuals on AWAs, they're earning 15% less. And for part-timers, predominantly women, they're earning 25% less. But how many of those people do you really think will want to go through the process again? Scrap what they're on and start again? Well, I think if I was a woman working part-time and I was earning 25% less than a woman performing exactly the same work on another kind of industrial instrument, I don't think I'd be very happy keeping my AWA, Barry. I think I'd quite like to go to a fairer set of work arrangements. But they, and they weren't coerced we into going into these arrangements in the first place. They didn't go in uh, with a blindfold on. Well, you can't possibly know that, Barry. We get stories all the time. Uh, I do personally, Labor members do, trade union officials do, indeed you see them in the media as well, where people have been told that you can only have the job if you sign an AWA, that you can only have the promotion if you sign an AWA, and then there is a more coercive element where you're told basically you can only keep your job if you sign the AWA, and in a world where you can get sacked unfairly if you work in a firm of less than 100 for basically no reason at all and have no recourse, if your boss basically gives a nod and a wink that he'd very much like you to sign the AWA, it will be, you know, not many workers that can hold up against that. So what happens after these, uh, these contracts run out? And for those who are happy to be on AWAs, what will replace them? 
Well, a third, uh, more than 30% of our workforce is currently covered by common law agreements. They offer a lot of flexibility and they'll be part of Labor's industrial, uh, industrial relations arrangements. Then, of course, you can have very flexible award conditions, you can have very flexible collective agreements. So what's the difference a... between that and AWAs? Well, the difference between that and AWAs is we're talking about flexibility off a fair base rather than flexibility downwards. What I don't want to happen in this country is that a, wor a, a female worker in a shop, uh, someone working part-time as a cleaner, can basically end up seeing their pay and conditions cut because of uh, agreements like Australian workplace agreements. That can certainly happen now. We know it is happening, and that's the vice that we want to get out of the system. Why are they so increasingly popular? That in the last three years, there's been a 30% increase, and as I said before, more than a million have signed up. Oh, Barry, let's get these statistics in some sort of perspective. 2.4% uh, of the Australian workforce has Australian workplace agreements. That compares to around 30% on common law agreements, 20% on awards only, 40% on collective agreements. These are at the margins of our industrial arrangements, but we know that for the workers that have been subject to them, many of them have lost pay and conditions, and that's the government's own figures. Interestingly, the government that beats its chest and says it's so proud of AWAs no longer publishes these figures. It could give us these figures this week in Senate estimates. It could let me and my staff go down and have a look at Australian workplace agreements, of course, with individual workers' names taken off, but they could let us in the building for a couple of weeks to produce our own analysis. But I think you and I know, Barry, that they're not that proud of Australian workplace agreements because they don't not want you or me or the Australian people to actually know the true details about them. That's why they're covering them up. But apart from AWAs, there are a lot of non-union collective agreements as well. Is that the biggest concern that you have, that it cuts out the middleman, your power base, the trade unions? Oh, certainly not. Uh, Labor introduced non-union collective agreements into this country uh, in the 1998 reforms uh, introduced by Laurie Brereton. Uh, so I haven't got any problems or dramas there. They were actually introduced into this country by Labor and any other suggestion is a rewriting of history. I know Sir Kevin Rudd was quoted at the weekend as saying he's never really been that close to a union. Is that something he should be boasting about? Well, there are all sorts of uh, reasons people join the Labor Party and all sorts of paths in the Labor Party. Uh, I've never worked directly for a union. I did do a lot of union industrial relations work as a lawyer. Uh, there's uh, nothing about uh, coming from a union that necessarily credentials you to be in the Labor Party. Many people do, many people don't. Kevin's work history is obviously different to that and he's proud of that work history and he should be. He spent a lot of time serving, serving this nation in very important capacities. Now, in unfair dismissal laws, they have been abolished for all firms with less than 100 uh, employees. Is it your intention that there will be no exemptions? We are mindful of the requirements of small business when we are dealing with the issue of unfair dismissals. I want to be talking to small business about this issue, as does uh, the responsible shadow minister with a particular relationship with small business, Craig Emerson. So we're open to discussing with them their concerns. Uh, but Barry, the Howard government never told us before the last election anything about its new industrial relations agenda and it certainly didn't tell us anything about abolishing unfair dismissal rights for people in firms of less than 100. And some of the legal interpretations that have now been put on these laws mean even if you are in a bigger firm, your rights are really quite uh, lean and you can be sacked very easily. Now, I think people do want a sense of basic fairness at work, and that's what we will be trying to achieve throughout our industrial relations laws, but also in the area of unfair dismissals. So does that mean you might come up with some sort of arbitrary figure, whether it be 10 or 20 or 30 employees? Barry, look, I want to be discussing the legitimate concerns of small business. I certainly understand those concerns include being hauled off to a commission, losing hours of work when you could have been at your small business actually getting things done. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got a fast system, an efficient system, and we will be talking to small business about its full range of concerns. And particularly with small business, I mean, I just simply ask the question, why would an employer 
any employer sack somebody for no good reason when they then have to turn around and recruit and train somebody else with the, with the loss of productivity that comes with that. Well, absolutely. And uh, for most employers in this country, they would never dream of sacking someone unfairly for no good reason. Uh, most employers are very good employers and care a lot about their staff. But when industrial relations laws come into play, they tend to come into play for those hard cases where someone has been treated unfairly. And we do know that unfair dismissals happen. I know that from uh, my work as a lawyer. Uh, I've cited it as an example before, but there was a case my firm dealt with where uh, at a bus depot, the boss's dog had bitten a worker. The worker complained about being bitten and the worker got sacked and the, bo and the boss didn't bother chaining the dog up. Now, I think every Australian would go, well, that's pretty rough. Uh, and for those sorts of cases, we do, of course, need good laws, good unfair dismissal laws. It's becoming increasingly difficult isn't it to maintain that work choices is a job, a job destroyer when you look at the statistics? Well, I've never said work choices was a job destroyer. What Labor has said about work choices consistently is that it was going to eat at the foundations of fairness in our workplaces. Well, you've never said it was going and to cost jobs. And I think, well, I've never said it was going to cost jobs. Uh, and what we've said is it was going to cost fairness, and it has costed fairness. But Barry, if I can just spend uh, half a minute talking about this employment argument, we've got the Prime Minister, Treasurer Costello, the Minister for uh, Workplace Relations, Joe Hockey, all trying to tell us that jobs growth is about the Howard government's industrial relations laws. Well, haven't these blokes ever heard of the resources boom? I mean, anybody who looks at the job growth statistics knows that what's driving economic growth in this country is the resources boom. That's why we're seeing big leaps of employment in the mining sector. When you actually look at the statistics for small business, the, the end of the economy they say is most benefited from their new industrial relations laws, we see just 1% of uh, growth over the life of the Howard government, oh sorry, the life of the work choices legislation. Uh, so we know that this economy and jobs growth in it is being fuelled by the resources boom. Just on climate change and the coal industry, and uh, uh, certainly Kevin Rudd has said uh, that Tim Flannery is wrong when he says the coal industry should be shut down, and Bob Brown has said the same thing. But is Peter Garrett wrong when he says, as he's quoted in the Newcastle Herald, as saying there should be no automatic expansion of the industry? We need to be mining coal. We will be mining coal. Senator Bob Brown's statements are just, you know, plain dumb, really, uh, and should be rejected by anybody in politics who's thinking about these issues seriously. But, but Peter Garrett's co the... uh, comments are relevant, given that he's the minister, and he's talking about a freeze on growth. Certainly no growth, he said, ahead, ahead of a huge amount of scrutiny. Well, what I've heard Peter Garrett talk about is the need for development of clean coal technology. That's the future and the people who work in the coal mining industry themselves know that we need a future that is dealing with climate change. So there's a consensus, if you like, uh, between, uh, between us, between those who work in the coal industry, that coal is going to be a big part of Australia's future. But where our future in coal is going to be different from the past is we've got to sprint towards the development of clean coal technologies. Two months in, what's the key difference between Kevin Rudd and Mark Latham? Kevin Rudd is a man whose eyes are firmly focused on the next 10 years for this nation. He's focused on the big picture challenges that we need to deal with if this nation is going to have the best possible future and particularly the best possible future for Australian families. That's why we're talking about things like climate change and infrastructure and ending the blame game, all of these big challenges for the nation. Uh, Kevin is a very measured and responsible person and I think that shows in everything that he does. Better qualified, better suited than Mark Latham was? Well, I would like to talk about this experience argument a little bit. I mean, the Prime Minister, when he got desperate in question time last week, was uh, all about the experience argument. I mean, the problem for the Prime Minister is if you reduce his argument to its logical conclusion, the only person who has the experience to be Prime Minister is the man who's been Prime Minister, i.e. the only person in this country who can be Prime Minister is John Howard. Now, it's a ridiculous argument. 
John Howard wasn't Prime Minister for a day before he was Prime Minister. Treasurer Costello wasn't Treasurer for a day before the day he became Treasurer, and indeed he'd never served as a Government Minister before he took up that job. Uh, Kevin Rudd is presenting with a wealth of life experience and also a wealth of ideas about the future of this country, and that's what's going to credential him for the job. If it's an experienced team, why is there this talk of John Brumby going into federal politics and perhaps taking a senior economic portfolio? Look, I've seen that flurry in the Victorian newspapers too, uh, and John Brumby has denied it, denied that there is any uh, move in his head about federal politics. Uh, I'm enormously fond of John Brumby. I worked for him. Uh, he's a tremendous contributor in the Victorian government, uh, and that's where he is going to be as Treasurer in the Victorian government, doing all of the things he does so well, and which Victorians have rewarded the Brax Labor government for with such a resounding election victory. Julie Gillard, thanks for your time this morning. Thanks, Barry. I think 2007 being an election year, I think it's going to be a closer challenge than maybe we've had in the last couple of terms. Okay. I definitely think Kevin Rudd does have what it takes to beat the PM. Uh, it's just a question of whether he can convince uh, us, the voters. I think people will start warming up to Kevin Rudd and his uh, colleagues, uh, although some people say uh, they, he hasn't got the experience. Australians like to look at the, the team as a whole running the country and not just, not just the individual. I'm not sure I agree with you there so much, Greg. It seems to be pretty personality-based a lot of the time. I think if uh, people are comfortable in their way of life um, and things are rolling well in the economy, I have the feeling that people will stick with the incumbent government. Um, mm. I think the only way uh, Rudd can come in is if he brings up new ideas and pushes on local issues. My feeling is with the drought, uh, that will have a bigger impact on the economy than probably most people think. I think uh, long-term policies are fairly important, that uh, both of the uh, major parties look long-term and think about what's going to, how the country is going to be in 50, 75 years' time. I think people feel that there is a bit of, there is a credible alternative being offered this time around with a new, relatively youthful leadership team against uh, a government that is probably cocky, possibly arrogant. Um, you know, I think Australians feel like they've done a good job, but uh, maybe it's time for a change and it's just a question of whether or not enough people are going to think that. And that's what the public says time after time. They want a credible alternative. Uh, has Labor crossed the Rubicon on that particular aspect of it, Lenore Taylor? Well, I think our rowers were pretty illustrative. They're looking at Rudd as a credible alternative leader, but I don't think they sounded like they'd locked in a voting intention yet. And I think we need to remember that when we look at these polls, that people haven't made a decision yet. They're just thinking about it and looking at him. Very early days, Andrew. They are very early days. I think Rudd has passed the character test. People like what they see of him, but I don't think he's yet given them anything to judge on whether you can pass the policy test. But Malcolm, you'd have to admire the way that he's gone so seamlessly from knowing everything about foreign affairs to everything about everything. I think he always knew everything about everything, Barry. <laughs> he just, uh, just specialised for a brief moment in his vast career and told us about foreign affairs. We just forgot to ask. <laughs> we, we just didn't ask, that's all. <laughs> OK, hold it right there, because first we need some background and analysis. And we're joined, as always, on a Sunday morning by Paul Kelly, political commentator with The Australian. Paul, good morning. The summer was really all about Kevin Rudd. How do you think he's going? I think Kevin Rudd, Barry, has made an incredibly impressive start as Labor leader. Uh, the government's worried about him and frankly it's got every reason to be worried. Uh, Rudd's style is quite fascinating. He's calm, he's confident and he reassures people. Rudd, like John Howard, I think understands the basically conservative nature of the Australian electorate. Now of course it's early days so let's put in all those qualifications. But I think Rudd is a much more rounded individual and politician than many people realised. He's a good community-based politician. He can relate to people very effectively. He's effective against the Prime Minister in terms of the 24-hour media cycle. And he's a policy man. He will leave his imprint on Labor policy. He recognises that Labor can't win against Howard just by running on negatives. The other point to make is there's a lot of goodwill towards Rudd. People want him to do well. 
Uh, I think there's a goodwill factor in the public opinion support for the Labor Party. What Rudd's got to do is he's got to convert the goodwill factor into hard votes. Well, Paul, let's look at this week and uh, we'll remind ourselves first of all of the, the stumble uh, from the Prime Minister during the week. Does the Prime Minister recall his industry minister saying just six months ago, I am a skeptic of the connection between emissions and climate change? Well, let me say to the Leader of the Opposition that uh, uh, the, uh, the jury is still out on the degree of connection. I mistook that as a reference to the connection between climate change and drought. Uh, having read uh, the transcript of the question, it's quite clear that I did mistake it. Paul, do you see a whole lot of significance in that? I think that John Howard clearly did not have a good start to the parliamentary year, Barry. That sort of mistake was not just embarrassing, but it was also highly symbolic, given that Labor's argument against Howard is that he's yesterday's man. On climate change, which was the focus for much of the week, uh, John Howard is uh, trying to catch up, if you like. Public opinion has shifted and the Prime Minister's got to uh, try and uh, regain lost ground. And I believe what we'll see this year is John Howard embracing policies mm. such as a national emissions trading scheme, which he previously rejected. Kevin Rudd's strategy this week was to brand John Howard as a climate change sceptic to ensure that when Howard does change his policy, that that uh, new policy will also be branded accordingly. I think Howard's going to have to work very hard during the course of the year to get away from this branding as a climate change sceptic. And of course there's a risk for Kevin Rudd in all of this as well, with the government already running the line that they'll put uh, ideology before jobs. I think there is a risk here for Labor. I mean, there's no doubt, of course, that the climate change issue is a political dividend for the Labor Party, but Labor's, Labor's got to be careful. It does need to put distance between itself and the climate change apostles, people like Bob Brown and Tim Flannery, whose ideas and solutions would do a lot of damage to Australian society and to the Australian economy. And I think Rudd clearly understands this point. He's doing this already. It'll be interesting to see how Peter Garrett positions himself. Uh, the policy uh, challenge here for any Australian government is to introduce arrangements which can cut back emissions uh, while doing the least possible damage to the Australian economy. That is the rational position. It's the sensible position. And it's very important for Labor to remain cool and rational uh, in this particular environment. The political uh, task for Labor, of course, is, uh, to, is to ensure that it doesn't just win on the climate change issue but lose the election on the economy. Uh, we should bear in mind, of course, that climate change won't be the most important issue of the upcoming election. And, Paul, just finally on the Water Summit, uh, no resolution yet, but surely one when they next meet? I think so, Barry. I mean, John Howard wanted to cut the deal on water this week. The Premier's denied him. The issue is too big. Uh, the money is too great uh, for there not to be a deal between John Howard and the Labor Premiers. I think we'll see that deal. This is really important uh, for John Howard because he does have traction, he does have credentials on water, he's done a lot about water in recent years. He wants to make water the centrepiece of demonstrating his environmental credentials. This is all about his uh, election year strategy and I think we will see a deal in a few weeks' time. Paul Kelly, thanks for your time this morning. Now we'll go uh, start right from the beginning to election timing. Um, it can be held 33 days after July the 1st, which is August 4, the very first date. Uh, the Prime Minister, of course, there, there is an APEC meeting in September. The Prime Minister had this to say on 3AW during the week about election timing. Prime Minister, the APEC meeting in September, is there any possibility the election will be held before that? Oh, I don't know. I think it's more likely than not that the election will be held uh, around the end of the year, but uh, I haven't turned my mind to the timing of the election. What's the odds on him trying to avoid the bush factor? by going early. <clears throat> I don't think so. He's only gone... Uh, the three elections in which he's had control, he's only gone early once, and that was in 98. Mm -hmm. He's consistently said uh, the, the punters want governments to go the full term, which would be October, November. And you've got to remember, it, 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 if there is any odium of him uh, being uh, associated with, with George Bush during APEC, there is the overwhelming spectacle of the Prime Minister of Australia being host to presidents, kings, potentates from, <laughs> from worldwide. And that's, that's not a bad the thing. The event itself image. supersedes any negativity on, on the 
George Bush factor. Well, I, I agree, and it also depends even how he plays the George Bush thing. It could be that he reads in the right act on something or other. I don't know. But uh, I think the Howard prefers to go to the uh, around November, December, like he's done before, um, in part because it shows he's unflappable and he likes a sense of continuity and order, which is his image. Yeah, I agree with all of that, but I think right at the end of the day it will come down to a pragmatic political decision and if Kevin Rudd for example stumbled or there was a window of opportunity to go early I don't think he'd you know turn it away because of APEC. He'll go when he wants he to win. Can, he, he can go he when he thinks he can win. And I think it's as close as we've had in a long time to a set date just the same. Yeah. Late October early November. Now the prospects are we getting close to a 50-50 situation? I'm finding the debate very interesting I agree with Paul Kelly that by the time of the election we will have moved on to a situation where things like climate change and water will be a debate of details between different policies but not a debate of qualitative difference. I think the economic debate is really interesting because John Howard's got his record and the good situation now to run on but, but Kevin Rudd is talking about the future and talking about how the government hasn't locked down this economic boom to ensure our prosperity in the long run and I think that debate will emerge over the year as the, the really mm. critical one. An unemployment of 4.5%. I was a little surprised when Julia Gillard said that she, she'd never personally said that the work choices would be a job destroyer. If she did, there were one or two of her sure colleagues did. might have said that along the way. Absolutely and I didn't see her standing up and saying Come on, Kim, that's wrong. No. <laughs> no, but the, base, the basics is, of course, that they were saying that there were going to be people sacked unfairly, lots of them. Well, we just haven't seen that. The whole thing about the that uh, easy, it's an easy fire, easy hire. It's not just the legislation isn't just to make it easy to fire. It's in order to make employers feel they can take a chance in hiring people, and that is exactly what we've seen. Yeah, we the, haven't seen the the, the whole scathe, you know, swathe of people being sacked for cruel and terrible reasons, but we have seen a jobs boom. To be fair, we probably haven't seen the full way that the legislation could be used because unemployment is so low. Employers really want to hang on to the employees that they've got and That's they're not right. utilising the full potential of the legislation yet and that makes it harder for Labor to make its case. Oh, you're right. And as I've said before, you would only see this in a, in a, in a downturn when employers are laying off people, not because they don't like the colour of their eyes, but in order to save a business and therefore the jobs of other workers. So we will see the worst of it in downturn, but that's and, what we and, need to see. And Julia Gillard this morning did seem to signal some flexibility on that question of, uh, of unfair dismissals that I don't think we've heard before. I think it's the sort of flexibility you got when you're starting again completely on your policy. Because if we remember that Kim Beasley uh, had a policy out there of some sort of tribunal to which these cases could be referred, that seems to have been uh, scrapped completely and the Labor Party is starting again. So effectively it doesn't have a policy it, on unfair dismissal. And it's the flexibility you need when you want the small business vote in Queensland. <laughs> that, that's right. And, 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 and uh, you might find that uh, they end up with, with a quota, you know, like very close to 100. Yeah. I couldn't but, understand something that Julia Gillard said to you though. You put to her that there's a million people in AWAs, I'm one of them, um, and they would not like it being taken off them, and I wouldn't. Um, how does she then equate it with saying there's only 2% two, 2 of the Australian uh, workers on AWAs? It's not a 50 million workers out there. I mm. wonder whether Labor is ignoring the fact that there are a million people who have signed AWAs, and many of them, I would suspect, are comfortable with it and wouldn't like the change. Well, I'm taking the government at their word on that, that they're over a million, they rolled out a birthday cake, cake or something, didn't they, to celebrate mm. when, the, when the one millionth person signed up? Uh, let's talk but about that doesn't the... mean there's still a million current agreements. Hmm. And yet Some I think of them there's a have... significant number of people that there, there would a significant be number, forced sure. to give up something that I think many of them would have voluntarily signed. Yeah. OK, let's talk about the week in the Parliament. I already raised this with Paul Kelly, but the, um, uh, the Prime Minister, your gaffe, and this is, uh, this is how uh, Tony Burke from the Labor Party described it. He's a very clever politician, um, but you know, a couple of years ago the John Howard of old did not make mistakes like that. Now, what is he saying? Is that another way of saying he's getting old without saying he's getting old? It's a well, way of saying he's getting old. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, uh, the Labor Party knows that John Howard's 68 or, uh, and will be 69. It was 60. It'll be 68 after the next, yeah. at the next election. But doesn't want to say so because that could uh, be insulting to the chron chronologically progressed. <laughs> but wants you, to, wants you to know that that he, in political terms, is relatively uh, Australian political and relatively old man. Now, the, the rowers, that, were, that was an interesting conversation they had. Then the last chap pointed out that uh, that uh, maybe it's time for a change. Remember the 2004 election, experience 
was a key factor in, in the government's campaign against Mark Latham. Well, things might have turned around now, where in fact experience doesn't mean uh, you know, a steady hand at the tiller, it means an old hand at the tiller. And uh, that mightn't be as appealing to, uh, uh, to voters. But I think Labor's uh, concentration on age, when they can get around to it, factors into the campaign they want to run about Howard being yesterday's man and that's why this issue was so potent this week. I think actually Howard really did misunderstand the question. When you listen back to the hand side, he does sound like he's answering a question about was. drought. Yeah. But and he has the, a hearing problem. And he has a hearing problem. Account. But in the end it didn't matter because he does have a credibility problem on climate change mm. and that's why Labor's attack was so potent because he has been ignoring the advice that he's been getting for 10 years because he has been a climate change sceptic and he's a mm. latter day convert when public opinion opinion him. That's why it was a potent attack. It's not actually a convert, I should imagine. He's just doing what he a feels pragmatic. is necessary. But I, I think it's not true, actually, to say uh, he hasn't made these mistakes before. I mean, the Manildra affair, for example, was exactly that uh, an issue where he uh, said something that wasn't true. Um, and I think he claimed then he didn't hear the question properly, too. So, mm. But uh, obviously they will saying he has a hearing problem when one. he's under pressure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry? Ah. You're saying he only has a hearing problem when he's under pressure? Uh, no, I, I think, you know, sometimes we like to hear what we prefer to hear. Or yeah, imagine, yeah, look, just to get clarified, he was having a go at Kevin Rudd because Rudd had, had pulled a stunt with a farmer near Goulburn and the farmer had said, well, uh, you know, I don't believe there's a link between the drought, the drought. and climate change. That's right. And, and, and the Prime Minister got up and, and mumbled something about, oh, well, you got a sceptic uh, talking to you if you don't, and then went into, in, into that. And, and he just... Mm -hmm. He was just so busy trying to score a point of Rudd that he that he lost himself. Well, and also politically, he doesn't want too str strong a connection drawn between the drought, which is a real and mm. tangible problem here, and climate change. Look, it's the, a, that's it's exactly the same. right. The drought is the motor be, yeah. behind uh, the prime motor behind a lot of this. Well, and it is connected to climate change. I mean, even the government concedes that the that there Ooh. is a connection. It's just not no, a no, linear, not direct true, connection. Not, yes, look, they do. They the reason... say that the drying of the southeast corner of the of well. the country is in part due to climate such change. such a long bow. In fact, it's... it's well, it's a long bow that Malcolm uh, Turnbull I'll, draws. I'll, I'll give you the reason why it's a long bow, and that is the Bureau of Meteorology and other long-range forecasters are predicting that the drought will yes. end this year, not because global warming doesn't El exist, Nino plays but because a role. the El Nino thing. No, no, no. And the I'm Southern not suggesting Index. that the drought is entirely caused by climate change. Clearly it's were. not. But climate change is having an effect on the climate of the southeast corner of our country. You can't possibly well, the deny drought, that. When the drought, if the drought breaks, as is predicted, that'll be a very interesting in terms of how much heat that takes out of this. So this uh, right now, it's almost like an hysterical mania. Well, maybe that's true, Andrew, but the Prime Minister says that water is the big issue, not climate change. That's right. If the drought breaks, water pretty quickly vanishes as an issue, then climate change takes over? Which would be over? a big mistake. Which would be a big mistake because uh, droughts come and go and the next drought will be even less prepared uh, as cities grow and water resources, uh, you know, don't, don't really increase. But this is the interesting but, but thing. But how do you keep the country's attention on drought proofing, though, when the drought breaks? Well, I hope it's got their attention because right now every major capital city in Australia mainland Australia's and water restrictions with a couple mm. of them uh, short with only a year or two left of supplies. Mm. So better get their attention. That's the interesting thing about the Murray-Darling Basin initiative, that everyone's focused on this, this initiative, that it's in fact water for farmers in the country, not a drop for the water, of water mm. for the cities. We've got to get to drought proofing our cities. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the experience issue that you raised before and the coalition is going at Kevin Rudd on this uh, question of experience. They're saying that he can't have it both ways, that he uses his experience having worked for Wayne Goss in the early 90s as uh, an illustration of his experience in government um, so therefore he has to wear any of Goss's shortcomings. Is that a fair cop? Well, I don't... I mean, Goss has to wear Goss's shortcomings and Goss mm. has to bear responsibility for the fact that he was turfed after... Well, after alternatively, two and Rudd and can't turns. take any credit for what occurred under the, under the Goss's watch. I don't think he can take full credit for... for all the things that happened, but he can certainly present it on his CV as relevant experience for the job he's applying for now. Whether or not he can take total credit for the outcomes, it's certainly experience that he can cite. It just has to look, you can't make a blanket call like, I was there, therefore everything good happened, or I was there, therefore everything bad is, is my fault. You just got to look at decision by decision. What specific decision that he made, did he make in that time that was either good or bad? But I think so it's, it's really look, a little it's bit fair irrelevant. to say he was involved in a period of significant change in Queensland where it jumped from the, the Bajelke-Peterson uh, rather laissez-faire 
uh, approach That's to a government. Nice way of putting it. Well, no, no one voted for Kevin <laughs> Rudd. To, to, to the, uh, no, but government. he was involved. Goss, yeah. Look, it didn't say he yeah. was elected uh, a representative, but he, you can't deny he wasn't involved no, in that change. That. And, and, and anyway, have, have a look at the man himself. He, he, he is assuming that he's prime minister already. I mean, I heard him today on the. Uh, on, a, on another station saying, uh, I'm the man who is going, who is doing so and so. No, you're not. Oh, as Matt Price <laughs> wrote, I mean, most politicians wait until they're elected before they run the country, but not Kevin Rudd. He's no in time, a hurry. No time. But just, you're saying that what, what he's been blamed for in Queensland, Malcolm Turnbull in the Parliament um, this week, I mean, it was a bit of a stretch, but let's hear it again, um, mm -hmm. about one factor that, uh, that Kevin Rudd's been blamed for. Every day when pensioners pull muscles crack backs, lugging heavy buckets to water their gardens in Brisbane. When they look at their dry and desiccated lawns, their dead roses, they remember, Mr Speaker, the leader Order. of the opposition. It was, him. it was him and Wayne Goss in 1989 that chose not to build the Wolf Dean Dam. <laughs> the Kevin Rudd back syndrome. <laughs> <That's He's... laughs> Rudd sciatica. There was a special right. disease. He should have gonna... built that dam. Guys, well, well, look, is... we, were watching, we were watching it. I've got to tell you, it was special. And, and Turnbull's up there and it's quite spectacular. And he started pensioners making their pensioners. <laughs> well, Leo, where <laughs> earth is this going? It, it was just wonderful. And of course it was rubbish. There's a lot of people sitting behind him, I think, had the same thought. <laughs> uh, look, all right, a little bit purple. <laughs> but I can only conclude from the heckling he's got from the journalists uh, over this that a lot of journalists aren't gardeners, which I've always suspected. <laughs> <laughs> because, in fact, it's... It is true. It is Have actually literally true. Back? It is literally yeah. true that the AMA and whoever represents the chiropractors of Australia are warning of the bucket syndrome, which and 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 the AMA vice president Victoria is treating people with broken hips uh, from I've... lugging buckets because of these stupid water restrictions that come from not. Not Rudd back. All of which is Kevin Rudd's Melbourne. personal yeah. fault. No, no, no. But it, and the point Rudd. is, you have come to the is. table with that defence of Malcolm Turnbull without notice. It's <laughs> brilliant. No, I am part of He's the bucket brigade. Back. And I am He's filthy. I am back. filthy yeah. on it. Well, uh, as a result of that contribution, um, uh, Malcolm Turnbull went off and had dinner that night with some heavyweights, and uh, this was discussed on television uh, a couple of days later. Did you have to tell Malcolm Turnbull off? Tell us the truth. Look, did, uh, did, I, I, did I had a him? very pleasant dinner with him and some other colleagues on Tuesday night. It was the regular Tuesday night dinner. And you talk about question time and his we, performance? We, we, we gave him uh, a judicious appraisal of what was a very interesting <laughs> start. <laughs> All right. It was, certainly, it was certainly a grand entrance. <laughs> yeah. that. I think that's right. You know, Malcolm Turnbull is a little bit like the lawyer who hasn't actually got the brief. He, he knows all the facts. It's like a million words in search of a narrative. And uh, he's, he's lucky that Peter Garrett's even worse than Although that. Although in his defence, I reckon he performed very well on the 7.30 report debate. I thought he found uh, the narrative there and he was more able to explain complex issues than Garrett was. Garrett was assuming a lot of knowledge on the part of viewers, very detailed the, the, knowledge. The, 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 problem, the problem with both had. of them for us, we, we poor hacks and punters, is they know their brief so well that we're up to page 10 and they're explaining what's on page 25. And uh, they, they've got to wait for us to come with them. Yeah. It's a very complex issue. I, I got thought... the feeling after that debate, though, on the 7.30 report, that a lot of people would have said, I'll take both of them. I, I thought they gave a, 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 an articulate description of their, of their positions. I, I, I thought it was a really interesting insight into the two heavyweights that might help, you know, apart from the Prime Minister and, the, and Kevin Rudd, might dominate the political agenda. He had one guy that had lots and lots of facts but didn't know exactly what he was going to do with these, all these facts and mm. Peter Garrett trying desperately not to seem the extremist mm. on climate change and unwilling to engage in that. You can sort of see the caged Garrett trying to get out but knowing he shouldn't. Um, so I think that's really, really interesting to be the man with lots of facts but what's the solution versus, versus the guy that doesn't dare speak his mind. So I hope Malcolm Tur Turnbull is not morphed into just another politician like a Tony Abbott or no. a Peter Costello. I hope he, he retains his own identity and his own style. I, I, I think he very will. The, 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 the historical record of Malcolm Turnbull taking advice is, is, a, is a rather small publication. But it's interesting <laughs> that, uh, that uh, in, in, in terms of the government, that they have their three big hitters, uh, Howard, Costello, Abbott, and this week we saw them add two more. One of them, of course, was Turnbull, but the other one was Andrew Robb who's probably got more experience in politics than just about anybody on the government side of the benches. So I think they're the big five you'll be seeing over the coming months. Now, Kevin Rudd's uh, 
climate change summit. Is the media going to take that seriously? Well, I think Kevin Rudd has, needs to put some flesh on his climate change policy. The states are doing a great job in trying to devise how an emissions trading scheme would work in Australia. And they've already, say, taken these problems about the coal industry on board and have come up with plans about how you could virtually exempt in the short term the aluminium industry and, and soften the blow for the coal industry. But we don't know whether Kevin Rudd supports all of that or not. We don't have the detail of his climate change policy or of John Howard's policy. And I think to take them seriously, we really need to see, you know, the writing on the page. You're not really going to get it. It's an interesting call for the media, though, isn't it? As the, the opposition leader calls a, a summit. Um, I suppose it depends on who turns up. I guess the premiers will. Look, the, the, look, anything you've got to be... on climate change, the media is going to take yeah. seriously. Don't you worry. <laughs> yes, you know? but, but also the, the, a, a bit of healthy scepticism <laughs> here. We, we've seen. You're not use allowed a... to be sceptical on climate change. No, <laughs> not, since, not since November, <laughs> <Watch> Andrew. <laughs> 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 we, 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 Rudd has used the premiers to deal him into the 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 water debate, the rivers debate, and, and we saw that sort of rather a contrived sort of uh, images uh, Friday of, of premiers. <laughs> sitting around a table nodding so, as, as Kevin <laughs> said he was glad to be there. And, and it, it's, it's, he, he keeps saying, oh, I'm just a practical bloke, as if he's walking well, past your house and saw the, the, the fringe... The, just the, just the, hold that thought and we'll, we'll have a look at what he did say right. about the water, uh, the water summit and what he can, can bring to the table. Yes. What I'll be doing in the two weeks ahead is trying to help bridge the gap between the Commonwealth and state positions because the national interest demands that. What an altruistic <laughs> He's guy! Very good. He's, don't you love it? It's fantastic. Yeah, we just happened to be walking past and saw something. You know, the well, shingle I'm needed. A, uh, I'm a practical sort of chap. Yeah, I walk what, what, what he's done is, is, is use the premise to get, as I say, get him in there. But you've got to look at it uh, and, and see, ask whether P Peter Beatty is going to knock back all that dough, plus the potential for uh, more development money for North Queensland, uh, whether Mike Rann is going to be uh, tossing away the opportunity for Adelaide to have a lot of its water problems solved, whether Steve Brax is going to toss away Ma Iama. Of course they're going to go for this deal, or they're going to have to stand up there and say, yeah, we're the premiers who knocked back the first cohesive mm. uh, uh, right. attempt to reorganise our major but river I system. But I think they're absolutely right to want to see the fine print. If they're going to sign away control over a resource as critical exactly. as water, exactly. if I was them, I'd want to know who was going to manage it, and I'd want to know what sort of say the National Party and their irrigated constituencies were going to have over what water went back into the river and therefore flowed down the stream to Adelaide. Yes, but, but wasn't there also an element of politics in this, as the Prime Minister said, they wanted to hurt me. They wanted to Ooh. cause a bit of political Listen. pain along the way, and there's no way they wanted him to walk out of there with an instant victory. Of course not. But the, the whole thing is, in a sense, really unreal. It's arguments about scraps of paper and who's got the title on their desk, and you know, it's weird. People are focused, they're panicking on, on water because they haven't got much themselves. There are water restrictions. Who are these people? Mainly voters in the cities. You're what really is honest. this deal? You've never yeah. stopped all it's morning. Back. What is, Where uh, the it's it's back. Back. <laughs> and, and the thing is, they're focused on the Murray-Darling plan, which is in fact who's going to be in charge. It's not, here's a whole pile more water. It's just weird. Well, have you noticed that in fact that nowhere yet have we seen any discussion about how much water is going to be taken exactly. out of production and put back into the river or vice versa. Back the actual the quantities of water have not been discussed. That's going to be determined by SIRO and guess when? After the next election. Look, it's unreal. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 voters are panicking but they're not going to get much water from this. It's weird. OK, let's talk about David Hicks and um, can somebody try and explain why this didn't really seem to bother the government six months ago, but now they're angry, very angry. Polling. Polling. Look, look uh, uh, Australians know what due process is and they see it's not applied to Hicks. They're not... They, I mean, they, want him, they wouldn't mind him tried in the United States, but they see it's taken five years. Look, let's fight. Hicks is but at least... Why is five uh, years so significant when four and a half didn't seem to, to bother the government? Five years does. Well, I'm, I'm just talking about punters, not, not the government. Okay. But there's been a building up. Now, not only is, is there concern about how Hicks has been treated, Australians look at that and see there's something wrong. That's expanded to other matters. Well, if there's something wrong here, there must be something wrong with our relationship with the United States. So... Uh, are we being pushed around by the United States? Did we go into Iraq because we were pushed around by the United States? The Hicks infection is spreading to a whole swag of other issues, 
uh, and that is harming the government. Without um, and, and also until the extent that Hicks has, has been promoted as some sort of hero, which he ain't. And I, d I don't think, though, in Voterland, there's any enormous sympathy for Hicks himself. I no. mean, there is quite a lot of evidence that this guy travelled the world looking for terrorist causes to take up. But I think people think he's not he's being denied due process and at the five year mark thought enough was enough. And I agree with you, it's it's feeding into this sort of subservience argument which mm. people are uncomfortable about. They want a strong alliance but they don't want to be unquestioning. And I think five years is significant, the, the, the round five. Five years seems about enough for a guy to have done what he's done, you know, that's enough jail and that's enough. And the worst of it is, I think what's really shocked the government, is that it now seems that the chances of even a trial this year before the election seem very, very uh, small, really. Mm. There's going to be a challenge inevitably. The lawyers will keep stalling it. They don't want this to go to uh, final trial. And uh, I don't think we will see a... a Court verdict on David Hicks this year. Mm. Charging him though with attempted murder seems to be a bit of a stretch. Wouldn't conspiracy to murder make more more mm. sense? Absolutely. There's lots yeah. of problems with the charges themselves, which is exactly yeah. going to be you know, give rise to more court uh, court battles. So that's the real problem. I think Hicks will not, in the end, be tried and will be released without having faced that trial. Kevin Rudd this morning uh, on Meet the Press was talking about policy on Iraq, uh, not if but when he's elected um, and he was um, uh, he was saying that there would be this uh, transition period where they would wait for the turnover of troops it could be six months beyond Labor's election is, is that that's been his consistent position? He said all along that he wants to um, do it in consultation with the Americans and wait for the next troop turnover. I think he didn't want to look precipitous. He didn't want to have a troops out by Christmas. He didn't want to do um, something like Beasley did. Remember when he said, oh, well, the first thing I'll do on the first day when I'm elected is bring the troops home. He wants to look reasonable and rational and like a good ally of the United States, but someone who's also standing up for what he perceives to be Australia's interests. I thought it was interesting that he actually put a figure in that interview on the number of troops that might have to be left behind to, uh, to protect the diplomats in Baghdad and he said that there might be one or two hundred. Now, um, you know, that's a fair proportion of the number that we've got there in the first place. So the differences are starting to be a bit blurred there between the two parties. But I think it's, a, it's a typical Kevin Rudd and I think this is really, it's not that important to me in, in a sense, but on this particular issue, but wider, Kevin Rudd is good at talking vague principles the acid will come on him this year when he has to translate principles into specific action and on climate change will be of course the most the most uh, difficult one for him because you know Bob Brown saying close the coal industry in three years is, is, is right if you really do believe that climate change is a catastrophe. Oh, no, not necessarily. If you put a price on carbon, you can introduce clean coal technology and you don't have to close the coal no, industry at all. No, if you really think it's a looming catastrophe, like Tim Flannery, that your house, an eight-storey beach house of water lapping up the top, that uh, it's a disaster for every species, mass extinctions by the end of this century, whatever, then no, you can't wait for that gradual thing. Well, you do literally have to close the coal industry, if you believe the rhetoric. And that's really a problem for Labor. That is the way. If you look at the face. IPCC and look at the rational sort of scientific debate, I think that a, a, a carbon price and a rational reorientation of the economy can, you know, do a, play saying, Australia's part. I'm just saying Bob Brown is saying what he must say if he really has the courage of his convictions, which he does. Now, Labor has to decide, do they have the courage of those convictions or are they just going to blather about... There may be a variety of views on that topic too because Peter Garrett, as I, as I mentioned to Julia Gillard, was quoted in the Newcastle Herald as saying there could be a sort of a... Uh, you can't expect the same sort of growth in the industry as there, have been, there has been over the peri previous decades. No, mm. but you can re restructure the industry without closing it down. And I don't think that there's any politician on the Labor side of politics who'd start talking about closing down no, the coal industry. That's exactly the, that's Nor exactly do they have to to have the courage of their convictions they in the do. way that you're... No, no of course no, if, they if don't. It, look, that's why Tim Flannery says it. No, no, <laughs> Tim, Tim Flannery is not that's a Labor politician. No, sorry, you're no, trying to blur the differences. No. They're, that's, That's precise, precisely what I'm saying, because they're not... Poli he, well, Bob Brown is a politician. It's precisely because Tim Flannery isn't a politician that he does say this. That's exactly right. But I'm saying if your you plan can't... is to cut emissions by 60%, 
then you really are going to have to do something huge. Now, if you might say, oh, look, they've got a century to do it, people like Tim Flair and Bob Brown says that's not I, true. I, I raised Iraq and you guys brought it back to climate change and I think that might be a reflection of how this year is going to go. I think climate change is mm -hmm. suddenly emerging as the big issue. On the panel this morning, Lenore Taylor, Malcolm Farr and Andrew Bolt. They'll be back in a few minutes. But again this year, Mike Bowers and his regular segment, Talking Pictures. I'm Michael Bowers and I'm pictorial editor with the Sydney Morning Herald. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonist for the Daily Telegraph, Warren Brown. Welcome back to the program, Warren. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Happy New Year. You too. And what a year it's going to be. Indeed. The Kevin Rudd uh, caravan is rolling along. Yeah, what a phenomenon this has become. It's just incredible, isn't it? And they are wheeling out the big guns to try and uh, to try and sort of discredit him every way. And Bill Leake has got Operation Rudd. Indeed. Isn't this a lovely cartoon? It has uh, John Howard and Peter Costello and this sort of uh, sort of private dick character here. <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and John. Howard saying, oh, so did he play up in his Bucks night? <laughs> and uh, uh, Peter Costello saying, oh, well, was he ever bashed by a cabbie? And the sort of private eye guy says, no, but he did turn up late to scripture class once without a note from his mum. <laughs> it's fantastic. Operation Rudd. And see, Bill's still drawing He's Kevin Rudd as Tintin. He's still, still got the Tintin. That's a great little thing. <laughs> I love this little Nico. Yes. This, uh, this sprung out when, when they went to the first uh, mass for the year, where they all go and sort of ask God for their help, which uh, they should do a little bit more of, I think. Um, he uh, gave uh, uh, Kevin and write a lift home and it's going, how congenial, yes, we might even run into the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> run over, perhaps. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, what's going on here, mate? Uh, well, this is sort of the, the ruddification of John Howard, if you like, and it has John Howard in his stripy pyjamas in the bathroom and he's looking at himself, fairly hapless expression on his face and he throws a bit of peroxide on his hair and it turns blonde and he swoops that over and he takes his glasses off and, of course, the eyebrows are attached, of course. <laughs> And then puts his little square glasses on and presto, it's, uh, you know, he's turned into Kevin Rudd. <laughs> he's morphed the ruddification. The ruddification. No, no longer relaxed and comfortable on it. Um, Mark Isn't Knight. Great? It's great. It's fantastic. Back yeah. to school. Yeah. Um, I just love Garrett here. He's just <laughs> listening to his little iPod. Yes, it's lovely. have <laughs> got a bit of midnight oil yeah. on there. <laughs> and, um, and Malcolm Turbo. Yeah, like that. this sort of this Pratt getting up there with his, his sort of my essay on water. And his, <laughs> and his hand up. It's just lovely. What I did in the holidays. Indeed. You know, it's just lovely. And his little thing here, look at this, Mark Latham was here, <laughs> scratched under the desk, isn't it, Mark? And he's trying to copy <laughs> the homework. Amanda Vanstone is a sort of loony in the background there. So, well, Warren, the winner has got to be Amanda Vanstone. Six years to write an alternative national anthem. What was she thinking? What was that all about? I've and got I, no idea. All of a sudden to come out and go, oh, by the way, I've written, you know, I've written the national anthem to the tune of Land of Hope and Glory. That makes it apparently. Your hair stand up. A Bill's done a cartoon, La Vanstonda. <laughs> Premieres at La Scala. <laughs> well, don't blame me. I got a Mexican wave when I sang it at the NCG. <laughs> now, Warren, surely you can do better than oh, this. Oh, well, look, absolutely. And we know that Adam Hills always sings uh, Advanced Australia Fair to the tune of uh, Jimmy Barnes' Working Class Men. And we can use, uh, I reckon we can do this with Amanda Vance. Hit it, one. baby. All right. It's a home to first Australians. We're joined from near and far. It's a shining light for freedom under southern stars. Whoa, I'm a Vance old man. That was awful. Terrible. It wasn't so bad. <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> okay, it wasn't good. Six years it took her to write this lyric. I know. You... That's One year for each verse. <laughs> <laughs> and then three minutes for Warren Brown to destroy it all in the crumbled heap. <laughs> well, let's, let's discuss television now and the Brecky shows and the Battle of the Brecky shows mm. on Seven and Nine. Of course, Seven for a while now have had Joe Hockey and Kevin Rudd. Um, and now Channel Nine have, uh, have copied them with Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard. Same time, same time slot. Um, we'll get a sense of uh, just how cosy an arrangement this can be. We had a lot of uh, people write in and say, oh, you know, what was it like behind the scenes? Was it tense between them before they, uh, before they came on last week? Let's have a little shot now. <laughs> there is Julia, there is Tony. How are you all faring? You, uh, you nervous, Tony? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She'll be very, very nervous. Julia is on fire this morning. She's going to hit you up about many, many things. <laughs> Good to, see, Good to you see you guys. How about Thanks. that? Come Brecky Central. The year has begun. Nice yeah. yeah. yes. Nice Thanks. Flash. Real flash. <laughs> You've been promoted. Place. You've got to flash your office. Well, no, no, the office doesn't change. Just oh, the uh, just title. Just the title. Just the business title. cards. Oh, business <laughs> cards. Have a great staff. weekend. We'll catch you next week. Thanks. See you later. 
It is an interesting development, though, isn't it? I mean, it's obviously all four of them see this as a real opportunity for them, and it is said that it worked for Kevin Rudd. Do you think it did? Do you think it was a factor? I think it was particularly helpful for Kevin Rudd because he was really good at the sort of policy wonk discourse, but he had to learn that telly banter, and that was a training ground, and he did it very methodically, like he does all things, mm. and worked away on it for years. We didn't really notice. I don't watch breakfast television, but it certainly, I think, it honed his media skills terrifically. It was well, great for him. Well, you have to start watching breakfast television because in that kind of format they're just as likely to let their guard slip. Yeah. yeah. Really, it didn't just work for Kevin Rudd, let's not forget, it also worked for Joe Hockey. You got a promotion out of it too, I That's think. That's true. So, yeah. it, look, there's it's two ways it works. One is, or three ways. One, as you suggest. Two, it's the exposure that they get, although it's true that, that not that many people are watching and certainly, I'm not, I wonder what well, the audience is. have enormous audiences. Yeah, no. but I'm not sure that in between making the kids sandwiches and rushing... Total you know, audience, really... 700,000 for the two programs. Yeah, not an insignificant it's figure. It's not a significant figure, but, but the third way it works is this, and I think this is probably going to work, be the most significant, is that suddenly each station has got a dog in the fight. That's their candidate. And I think mm. you know, mm. the networks could really you know, be influenced, I think, by well, who's well, there on and that the point, woman. Uh, uh, Kevin Rudd is the alternative Prime Minister, and, and mm. when will it become apparent to him that perhaps... He shouldn't uh, be. Uh, he shouldn't, he shouldn't uh, be uh, 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 on that uh, that sort of forum debating um, a relatively junior minister. And also, the, the insatiable uh, appetite of television for uh, for entertainment. When, when, when these programs start asking them to get on unicycles and juggle and whatever it else, macarena yeah, or that's juggle right. Snacks. Will they realise that, that uh, perhaps this isn't working for them? I think you're right, Malcolm. But I think that's where the third factor comes into play. Will Will Rudd want to? Uh, insult Sunrise after they've done so much mm. for him by walking out, and that's precisely. He would right never there. walk out on the Sunrise family. I don't think so. But, <laughs> but it's, it, I, I think what works for all of them is that it's personality driven, and that that helps. And, and I'm told that, that they were said, "Look, we don't want this to be too political. You know, that's why we get politicians together." But in an election year, it's going to become more political, and and they will be. And Joe Hockey will get a brief, and Julia Gillard will get a brief. You've got to take them on over these sorts of issues, and it will become increasingly political, and then. Mm. It'll the just smiles become... will be worn tighter this year on That's that show, right. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. Now, uh, final observations, uh, predictions in a moment, but first uh, one from me, and uh, we go to Queensland for this one. And it's the uh, Deputy Premier, Anna Bly, went, went on to a building site uh, during, during the Christmas break, very sensibly dressed at the, the top, as you'd imagine. Yeah, although not so <laughs> Not on a building site. Very impressive stilettos. Um, and, uh, and for another, we'll go to the United States. And, uh, and Hillary Clinton, of course, is going to make big news in the next couple of years. Uh, here she is attempting to sing the national anthem. <laughs> She is running for president, not American Idol. She, she went to the same as kids as Brown. Well, I was going to say the same singing coach as, as Billy Joel. Did you see him at the... Uh, at the, uh, the land uh, of the free and the home of the tone deaf. Yes. <laughs> now, Barack Obama, of course, has declared uh, that he's in the field. It's uh, yeah. two years of this. Yeah. But I think they'll fill the void. It's, it's going to be a fascinating contest. Well, it's interesting how it's turned out. Uh, the, the Democrat primaries will turn out into the battle of the minorities, in a sense. Uh, Hillary Clinton's wanting to be the first woman to be president. Uh, Barack Obama, the first uh, African-American. And Bill Richardson, the first uh, Latino. I mean, yes. <laughs> pick your minority. There's some minorities that will feel mighty ticked off. And I think Barack Obama's a little bit... Oh, Hillary Clinton should be worried about that if she kn knocks off Barack Obama. What will the African-American mm. vote think of that? OK, final observation, prediction, Lenore. I'd be interesting to, interested to watch the water debate as it goes on. I think the Prime Minister's got a great deal of kudos for his plan, and it, and it is a visionary plan, but I think as the details start to come out, the problems may also emerge about how well it will work and also with the National Party. And no water in the taps in Melbourne, Sydney, Andrew. <coughs> and Andrew. Yeah. And uh, Andrew's back. Malcolm. Well, I want to see if uh, Rudd's back is covered by Medicare. <laughs> uh, but, but also, I think we're going to hear more and more about uh, the issue of job displacement amongst the white-collar workers. Uh, jobs being set offshore, just as our manufacturing jobs have been set offshore. And, Andrew. and, and a parable for these uh, climate change times. Bob Brown's big victory to, uh, with the Franklin River Dam was to persuade the governments not to build dams. Water ran out. Now Queensland's building two dams and Sydney and Melbourne uh, having uh, the public qu uh, quizzed on whether they might want a dam after all. And that's it for this week. I'll be back with Offsiders at 10.30. But coming up next, Alan Collar and... In